So prevalence of uh, depression is big and it's on the rise. So over the last few years, we've seen a steep increase in the proportion of people who have had a uh, major depressive episode in the last year, and also in the lifetime prevalence of depression, um, such that about 30% of adults in the US have a major depressive disorder episode at some point in their lives. 30 million people, 30 million individuals suffer a major depressive episode in the last year alone. And perhaps most importantly for my talk, 30% of those patients do not respond to medication, and we can't manage the disease effectively. So there's a very dire need to generate new treatments for, for, these, for these patients. Um, so we talk about depression. What really is depression? It's a devastating psychiatric condition that is characterized by a variety of symptoms, some of which uh, are shown on the screen here. Uh, they're very familiar to you, probably this feeling of sadness or hopelessness, uh, lack of energy, loss of pleasure, uh, and fixating on past mistakes, uh, what we call rumination, and I'll come back to. So not every patient has the same symptoms, not every patient has the same combination of symptoms. So that points to a certain heterogeneity in the disease. It's not a monolithic entity, and still, the way we mostly treat this disorder is monolithic. So here's the brain, and we use pharmacological treatment primarily to treat depression uh, in these patients. And we got a fantastic primer from Dr. Paul on, on, on some of the advantages and disadvantages of using those, uh, but, uh, such as side effects and, and the fact that basically we're flooding the brain with these chemicals. So we're hitting a variety of areas that do not have the same function, they don't have the same biochemical profile, genetic profile, etc. cetera. Um, and still we know that the brain is heterogeneous. It has these different regions and not every region is equally implicated in the uh, generation of depression. So what I'm going to advocate for is a different treatment approach that is able to take into account this heterogeneity in brain regions and the fact that they're probably not all engaged to the same extent or damaged to the same extent in, in depression patients. So this is where we are. It's kind of a snapshot of what I just told you. And I want to tell you where I think we need to go from here. So we need a more complete understanding of the neural and biological basis of depression to develop more effective treatments. We need patient-specific approaches that take, take into account the heterogeneity in disease presentation and the constellation of symptoms that any given patient presents. We need new therapeutical approaches for non-responders. And I'm going to make the argument that we need to leverage previously untapped research and therapeutical opportunities to do this. So how exactly do we do that? I'm going to argue that neurosurgical interventions provide a unique opportunity to record extremely high quality brain activity and relate it to normal and pathological states. What I'm showing you here is a reconstruction of an epilepsy patient uh, that, that we work with. And what you can see here is that this patient had electrodes, many electrodes, hundreds of electrodes, directly surgically implanted directly into different areas of their brain for the diagnosis of their epilepsy. This opens up a fantastic opportunity because one, these provide extremely high quality, high temporal resolution, anatomically precise estimations of brain activity, which we, which, which we measure as voltages moving through time, but also because 30 to 40% of these intractable epilepsy patients also suffer from comorbid depression. So it gives us an opportunity to study patients with and without depression. And over time, we can collect sufficient data from all these different patients that uh, is coming from these different brain areas which we heavily suspect are implicated in depression. So how exactly do we do that? I mean, the simplest thing would be to just go in and record this electrical activity from a patient that's just sitting in the room, but I think that's not enough. I think that will only get us so far, and what we really need to do is to elicit some of these symptoms that are characteristic of the disease. And I want to go back to one of the symptoms that I mentioned earlier, which is rumination. Rumination is that nagging feeling that we did something wrong and that we wish we had done something else, which most of us can move past kind of naturally, but some depressed patients have a tendency to get stuck on, and they just keep brewing and thinking about the past and thinking that I got it wrong, I should have done something else. So we wanted to come up with a scenario and a possibility in which we would elicit that type of feeling in our patients uh, while they're in the hospital with these electrodes implanted in their brain. And the simplest we could come up with was a coin flip. I'm gonna ask you to bet repeatedly on a coin flip, and sometimes you'll get it right, Sometimes you'll get it wrong. It's a fair game. 
uh, we can all play it. We can all enjoy the rush of getting a hit uh, and the disappointment of getting a loss. But some people, including our depressed patients, we think have difficulty moving past that. So while the patients play this game, we're going to be recording this electrical activity from these electrodes, and we're going to separate it according to exactly what the patient just experienced. So what I'm going to show you is the electrical activity from one such electrode in a condition in the trials in which the patient actually got it right and won on the left, and in the trials in which they actually got it wrong. And every one of these lines in this plot is a single trial, and what you see is that faint um, blue line that indicates there's an increase in electrical activity after they see the outcome of the, uh, of the coin flip in the, term, in the times in which they, they got it right. When they got it wrong, however, there was a significantly increase, massive difference in the electrical activity in this particular uh, electrode. And so we think this is acute. We think this is potentially something that reflects something that colloquially we term regret, uh, which is very characteristic of uh, the experience, subjective experience of some of these uh, patients. And the last piece of the puzzle is that these electrodes are very powerful because they don't just allow us to record electrical activity with all these benefits that I mentioned, but they also let us modulate it. We are picking up the activity of hundreds of thousands to millions of neurons in the vicinity of these electrodes, and by passing small, safe amounts of current, we can modulate and uh, drive the activity of these neurons uh, up and down. And so we think that it is possible to use that electrical stimulation approach to take that activity, that hyperactivity, in the case of these regret trials, and turn it into something that looks more like the non-regret trials. And in this way, normalizing brain activity and hopefully the feeling uh, of rumination that these patients experience. So just to kind of recap and summarize what I told you, we intend to record neural activity during behavior using the surgical approaches, um, which are safe and effective. We're going to be evaluating brain activity while the patients play a simple decision-making game, which is designed to elicit those feelings that they experience um, in an extreme manner. And then we're going to try to identify healthy and patient-specific abnormal patterns of activity to finally use brain stimulation to normalize these aberrant patterns of brain activity back to normal. And in that way, recover the behavior, feelings, and thoughts of these patients to a healthy state. And then, very long term and kind of outside the boundaries of the One Mind project, but something that I think presents a real opportunity, would be to develop similar methods to treat other disorders that are also in need of novel treatments. So, what we want to do, really, is to, we care about the patients, we think about the disease, and we want to be able to help each of these patients that are suffering this devastating disease to get out of the dark hole that they live in and to live healthy, happy, and fulfilling lives. With that, I'd like to conclude uh, and thank One Mind, the Stagling family, the donors, uh, especially Russ and Stefan Dio, who funded my award, <laughs> um, and, uh, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>